Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to a new series. Today we are going to be looking in this series at True Peace, The Secret of Life. It is a look at the world's fastest growing and sustainable belief system in the universe. Yes, you heard correctly, the universe. You see, Islam is not only a religion for human beings, but for the whole of this universe. Worlds that we might not even have heard of or know of, Allah has full control and has created many things that we as humans are only now beginning to understand. Every being that Allah has created is in submission to Him. Even the insects, the birds, the flowers, the trees, everything is in submission to Allah. And so we're going to look in this series, inshallah, at how to find true peace and find the secret of life. Now it might be a bit of a simplistic uh, series, because many people say, well, I know all this already. But we are, inshallah, going to stop, pause, and ponder on each of the points as we go through them. And also have a look at a comparative point of view, how other religions or other belief systems see these same things within their belief system. So inshallah, it should be an interesting voyage of discovery. The Islamic framework or the framework that makes up the Islamic belief system is comprised of many, many layers. If we look at it from a point of view of a flower, if you take a flower, perhaps like a rose, and you peel off each petal, you get down to the main core of the rose in the middle, where the life of the rose actually comes from. This is how the rose is able to breed, if you want. It sends its pollen from one plant to the other. But it's the leaves on the outside that make the rose beautiful even though it's only the middle that really is any real significance. In the same way, when we look at the Islamic framework, there are many layers, many petals that make up what Islam actually is. We have a hope structure that makes up Islam. We have an educational structure that makes up Islam. We have a spiritual structure, a morality structure, a way of dealing in business structure. We have human rights or human responsibilities. We have a family structure. We have a social structure. We have an economic structure. We have a political structure. And we have a revival and growth structure for the future. This is what Islam comprises of. It's not just a single two-dimensional belief system. It's a living, breathing, three-dimensional, pertinent, real for today here belief system. You notice that I, whenever I say the word religion, I use the word belief. Because it's more important to have a belief system than to simply just belong to a religion. Some of you may have remembered from a couple of years ago, one of the talks that I did about religion. And I said religion is often understood like animals obeying their masters. If you call your animal towards you, you know these people who are dog trainers, the police who have these whistles and they know how to train the dogs for maybe sniffing out drugs or, or bombs or whatever they might do. That dog is religiously listening to its master. It doesn't know why it's listening. It doesn't know any reason that it has to do what it has to do, but it does it religiously. When the policeman or the controller blows that whistle or gives a command to that animal, that animal listens without hesitation it doesn't even know why. It has been programmed into it. It does it blindly, if you want to put it in that way. Islam is not a blind, I don't know why religion. Islam is, I know every reason why I do what I do. And I do it because it is an act of obedience to my creator. So it is not as a religion is in other sects or other belief systems in the world. So that's why you often hear me refer to Islam as a belief system 
rather than calling it a religion. So there's no misunderstanding of what that term means. So if we want to have an understanding of true hope, we have to have a look at the hope structure that is within Islam. So today we will be looking, inshallah, at the secret to sure hope. How to have sureness in your life of a hope that is to come. Many of the terms that we use, I will try to explain as we go along. What does hope mean? Hope means to have a belief in something. So you could say a sure belief, a sure hope, a sure desire for the future. So this is what we're going to be speaking about today, the components of a sure hope, a sure desire for the future, a sure belief. And we're going to be looking at what is a way to be successful in having the sure hope. The first requirement to having a sure hope is having a sure understanding of monotheism. There are many religions in the world who claim to be monotheistic. Christians claim to be monotheistic. Hindus claim to be monotheistic. Buddhists claim to be monotheistic. Everybody claims to be a monotheist. But when you start to peel away the petals, you find that none of them are monotheists. Even if we look in the Old Testament, which is the closest towards monotheism where we can actually come, we find that monotheism is not exactly 100% right there. Because when we look at monotheism, we look in the Old Testament, they believe that God dwelled in a tent, or that God dwelled in a temple, or that God dwelled inside a statue, which again takes away from the real hardcore, real honest to goodness monotheism, which should be strict monotheism. And that, unfortunately, we don't find in any religion in the world. But we do find it very strictly kept within Islam. In Islam, we don't believe that God dwells in a house that is on earth, or that he possesses some type of an object, or that he comes manifesting through a golden angel, or that he is a light that is caught inside a lamp and kept somewhere. These are the things that we find in many other monotheistic religions. We believe that Allah, the creator of everything, he does not dwell in this confines of this planet. Otherwise, he'd be limiting himself to a shape, he'll be limiting himself to a time, and he'd be limiting himself to a form. Nor does he sit on a gold throne in heaven, as we often get depicted within some other religions in the world, where you've got this man sitting with a scepter in his hand and you know, halo on his head. That is not the monotheistic understanding of who God is. Allah is beyond his creation, above the seven heavens, above his creation. Yet he has intimate, personal knowledge of every single fiber of beings, that, of every fiber of our being, of every being that's on this planet, of every atom, of every little atom within an atom he knows and has control of and has intimate knowledge of. Now, how does he do this? Some people might be confused at and going, I don't get that. How can God know everything? I mean, if he's busy watching what's happening in America, how can he know what's happening in Japan? Because we're looking at it from a human point of view. We're looking at it between a two-dimensional, three-dimensional understanding. We must understand that Allah is not limited to time or shape or space or form. Imagine you had a ruler in front of you right now, and you're looking at your ruler, and it has, if you come from America, I don't know how to give you the right measurements, but all the rest of us in the world, we use centimeters or millimeters. If you think of a 30 centimeter ruler, one being the beginning of your life and 30 being the end of your life. In fact, let's take it away from you as being a person and make it the entire existence of humanity. One is when human creation is begun and 30 is when human creation comes to an end. If you think of each millimeter along that line, Allah is able to move in time, space, shape, and form in 360 degree angles off that one centimeter, one millimeter, as you go all the way up to 30. He's not limited to straight linear life. We have a linear existence. Linear existence means we have a beginning and we have an end. Allah is not limited to a linear existence. That is a human understanding, a human limitation. Allah is not limited to that. So we can't think of Allah in the same limitations as linear thinking. When we talk about our past, our linear thoughts take us back to some previous period of time. But we cannot bring that past 
memory into our present reality. It's not possible because we are linear creatures. With Allah, that is easy to be done. That means nothing. There is no time limit to Allah. There is no shape or form limits to Allah. So we have to understand that when we're looking at strict monotheism. If we try to project Allah into the form of a human being with human limitations, we will fall short. And this is where we land up having problems later. This is when we get into complications. This is where Christianity had its downfall, when they tried to limit God to shape and time and form. And then the whole question about who God is suddenly became problematic doctrinal issue, where the church became split over whether God could actually know the future. Is there such a thing as predestination? Does God have beginning and an end? Because if he had a beginning, this would make him no longer God. So these are questions that came up in the early church. This is, these are questions that are plaguing the church even till this day. We don't have these issues in Islam because we don't give God human qualities. Yes, he has attributes, but this is our limited understanding of who Allah is. So in our primitive minds, in our primitiveness, in a way to get it over to future generations to come, we have attributes. But we don't say this is what Allah is. We give explanations of what we see. Like if we had to push this vessel that's in front of me, we would be able to work out what happened by cause and effect, distance traveled, velocity. All those are attributes of the experience that just happened in front of us, the, the scientific mathematical formulas that would be required to explain that experience. But that's not exactly what happened. It's deeper than that. But we're just giving an experience that we have in our limited mind to explain it. In the same way, when we give the attributes of Allah, which sometimes are incorrectly known as the 99 names of Allah, there's more than 99 attributes of Allah. There are infinity and beyond attributes for Allah. Well, it's time for us to take a quick break. And when we get back from the break, we will continue, inshallah. All praise to Allah. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back. We are dealing with a new series today. And we are looking at how in this series to find a sure hope. And we're looking so far at the components of finding a sure hope. And the first component to finding a sure hope is strict monotheism. There is no religion in the world that has a logical, understandable, acceptable, believable, and feasible understanding of monotheism as we find in Islam. Every religion in the world falls somewhere along the line. The minute you start peeling away the monotheistic claims, you see it falls way short. And this is not because I am claiming that we as Muslims have the only strict understanding of monotheism. All we have to do is go and speak to some of the rabbis and ask a rabbi, tell me, Mr. Rabbi, who is the most closest on this planet today to monotheism? He will say, a Muslim. If a Jew cannot find a place of worship and there's no synagogue, He's not permitted to go to any other religious place of worship other than a mosque. In his own religion, if you took it to an analyst and you say to an analyst, look at all the religions of the world and come back to me in a week and tell me which one follows what is required from monotheism, from the definition of what monotheism, who follows it? And they will all come back and they will all tell you, without exception, they will all come back and say, Islam is the only one who follows strict monotheism. So the first component is monotheism, which is belief in Allah. Those of you sometimes get worried when you hear the word Allah, maybe you Christians and you're listening and say, what is this, is this another God? You say, you're speaking about strict monotheism, now you're using the word Allah. Well, Allah comes from the Hebrew word Allahim, Allah, Allahim, and we get the word Allah. It's just a phonetical vernacular between Allah and Allah. Some people in my country call God Nkulukulu. That's just the Zulu word for the same name. In Afrikaans, they would say Chot. In English, you say God. In German, you would say Gott. It's all the same you're referring to. Don't believe the harp. Don't believe the nonsense that you read on, on these bad, bad internet sites that are written by somebody who's just been vindictive. It's not a moon god and strange things like that. People say, well, what about in the Kaaba? When they opened the Kaaba, wasn't there a idol called Allah. There was also an idol called Jesus, and there was also an idol called God, and there was also an idol called Buddha. I mean, so you, that is a silly sweeping statement to make. These were pagan 
Arabs that were worshipping anything that moved. And of course there would have been an idol by the one true God's name would also be there. Along with all the other crazies that would have, they would have added in it. Anything that moved they would have turned into a God and named it a God. As we see in other religions in the world that have done similar things. So that is not proof that because the word Allah was used in ancient times that it somehow proves that Muslims have a God that is a moon God. This is nonsense. We find that the Hebrews will refer to God as Allahim. This is the same root word where it comes from. So that is the first component. The second component to monotheism that is extremely important to understand is that for a sure hope that is, is to understand that there is everything is predestined by Allah. Remember I explained that ruler how it has 30 centimeters on going from 1 to 30 and Allah can move in any direction. He's not limited to a linear living like we have a linear living, a linear existence. He's not limited by that. If you can understand in strict monotheism and a byproduct of strict monotheism is to understand that Allah is not limited. If you understand that, then you have to believe in predestination, that everything has been predestined. We call this an al-Qadr. If we believe that, then we understand that there is a sure hope in that, that there is a destiny for each and every one of us, that there is a plan for us. The next point to having a sure hope is to believe in the prophets that were sent, messengers that were sent by Allah, that all these messengers that were sent by Allah were not only humans, but also angels. So Allah sent angels to humankind. He, they were his messengers, and we'll be going through that, inshallah, later in the series. That he sent us books, that these angels gave commands to human beings to write these books, these texts. Why do we need a book? Because if we only have an oral tradition, it will be like a broken telephone. It will have changed so much we won't know anything like the original message was meant to be. And so this is why we need the books. And obviously, the person to write that book will be a messenger or a prophet. So far, we've dealt with five issues to finding a sure hope. Trust in Allah, knowing that everything is destined the way Allah wants it to be, that there are angels that have been sent messengers from Allah, that there are books that have been written with the commands of Allah, and that He has sent His prophets. And then we have to understand that there is going to be another life after this. This is not all there is. That there is going to be a life after this life. A life after death, if you will. And this is the hereafter. If you want to understand this life that we are living, it is a fraction of a second in comparison to life after death. You know, we've spoken on other episodes and other programs. We said that mathematicians have now discovered a formula, an acceptable formula. Because math, you can have a formula for anything but it has to be a provable formula, one that you can prove mathematically. I mean, mathematicians, theorists, that's what they do all day, come up with formulas that can be theoretically proven. According to the latest studies within mathematics, within proper math, I love math, by the way. If you want to see what I do on the weekends, that's what I do, I work out with math. And through math, they have discovered that resurrection of the dead is now a mathematical fact that when you die, you will be resurrected because it is a mathematical improbability and nothing to infinity chance that this is the end of it all. There has to be something after this, a resurrection. Will not be in the same form as we are now. We know this. Even math agrees with it, that you would have to come back in another state, but you have to come back. So they understand that. So we understand in Islam for a sure hope that you have to have a life hereafter. There has to be something after this life, a life after death, if you would, an eternity. But if there is a life after death, surely, working on a simple mathematical equation, that if you do one thing, something else will happen. Every action has to have an opposite or equal reaction. If there is a life after death, there has to be, you know it all, I don't even have to tell you, a day of judgment a day of recompense, a day of accounting. You have to have a day of reckoning. Maybe we shouldn't use the word judgment because when we hear the word judgment, I see a lot of you get scared already. People start going, oh, you know, it's only gloom. The day of recompense, the day of accounting, the day of telling up the sheets, looking at what you have done. Think of all those little deeds that you did that no one ever heard about. You know those ones that you wish someone had seen? You go, oh, I wish someone had seen what I just did today and they didn't, 
the one who was supposed to see it saw it. The one who it actually counts with saw it. That's the day when everyone will find out about that. So don't look at the day of judgment only in, as a way of fear, a day of being proud of what you did. You know, every deed that we did, there are so many rewards for everything, yet for our bad deeds, the hand of the one who writes it is held back so that we have an opportunity to repent. So we should, even the bad ones out there, even you guys that maybe think you're a little bit bad, even myself who sometimes think, you know, there's no forgiveness for that. I keep doing the same old thing over and over. It should be good news for us because we've been given the opportunity to start with a clean slate over and over and over and over again. Five times a day we've been given that, remember that credit card? You know my analogy with the credit card? We've got a spiritual credit card. Five times a day we're wiping that credit card. We are putting debits and credits and all sorts of other things on that card. We have the opportunity five times a day to clear our debts, to walk out with life with that credit card full with good deeds, with good actions, with good intentions, with good actions that will actually count in the hereafter. So there shouldn't be any of us that walk out of this life with a credit card that we owe, unless we are not following the sure hope components to success. We looked at the components in this episode today at how we can have success. We said that basically you need to submit the Creator who is Allah. Belief that Allah knows everything that will happen in each day. That there were angels sent, messengers. They were sent to give mankind good news, a hope, a sure hope. That these books would help us to find truth. That He sent prophets with the same message time after time after time. Same message, different time periods, same message. And that there is a life after this life, an exciting life after this life. That this life is a moment, if you took a coin and dropped it onto this table, the amount of time that it took for that coin is not even a second compared to eternity. That is your life. It's nothing. Yet we want to put so much time and effort onto this dunya, onto this life. And it means nothing. It is just a fleeting moment. And we'll look, inshallah, in the series, what the purpose of this life is, why we were here. What is that second for? If it's so insignificant, why are we even here for that one second? So inshallah, we'll be looking at that. And of course, we looked at the final point that if there is this day of recompense, that there is a day that we all have to give account for what we did, or for us to look at what we did with our lives, that second of our life, to be excited about it. Don't only look at the negatives in Islam. Sometimes people just want to concentrate on the negatives. There are so many more positives. Like I said, if you do the do's, you haven't got time to, do the don'ts. So spend your time in the next few days until we meet again next week, doing the do's, not doing the don'ts. If you have your non-Muslim friends who, who want to know more about Islam, this is the perfect series for them to watch. Get them to tune in. Send them a copy of the recording. Go to one of the social medias and, and post it up so people can come and watch this because it'll give them simple ways of understanding how to find sure hope in this life. In this series, inshallah, we are hoping to help you to understand the core of what Islam really is in a simple way, in a basic way, a way that everyone will be able to understand it, not in a way that you, know, that you need someone to come and interpret it. Just a simple way. This you and me sit, talk, and understand what Islam is all about and how to find a sure hope and how to find success. The secret is in submitting to Allah. And we'll look at more secrets in coming shows in the future, inshallah. So that's all the time we have for today. So from me, Arib Islam, till next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illa Allah, wallahu akbar, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyil azim. Glory be to Allah, all praise to Allah. There is no God but Allah, Allah is great. All power and might belong to Allah, the Most High, the Great. Subhanallah. One